literature now, when it is taken to mean creative or imaginative work, often raises the question, what's the point? For the Victorians, the point was obvious. Literature was the privileged means to uncover the truths of the human spirit. We don't believe that anymore. Nowadays, literature and the humanities in general are valued in our society, at least until a period of economic crisis. But when someone asks why, the answer is usually because studying literature makes you a better person. As the Marxist critic Terry Eagleton notes, this answer is at once strong and weak. Weak because it is supremely vague. Strong because it suggests that literature has a use. In my opinion, one of Eagleton's greatest contributions to literary criticism is to specify why studying literature makes you a better person. Literature of all types shapes consciousness and the unconscious, and as such, to study literature is also to study and question socio-political power relations, ideologies, and what it means to be a person in the wider society. The Argentine novelist Manuel Puig was born in 1932 in the Pampas town of General Viegas, situated roughly between the Andes and the Atlantic in the province of Buenos Aires. In 1946, the same year that Juan Domingo Perón was first elected president of Argentina, Puig began studies at Ward, one of Buenos Aires' most prestigious schools. Following his years at Ward, Puig studied in Buenos Aires at the Alliance Francaise, the British Institute, and the Dante Society. His original goal was to work as a film director, and he studied film and scriptwriting techniques at the film school de Cinecita. Though Puig never lost his interest in film, either in his personal life or in his novels, he was dissatisfied with the filmic realism that dominated his course of study and his focus shifted to writing. In 1967, Puig published Betrayed by Rita Hayworth, which sold very well and received much critical attention, both positive and negative. This novel was followed by Heartbreak Tango in 1969. The Buenos Aires Affair appeared in 1973. Kiss of the Spider Woman, perhaps his most famous novel, was published in 1976 and was immediately put on the government's list of prohibited books under the short-lived presidency of Isabel Perón. The novel would remain banned until the fall of the military regime in 1983. As political violence increased under Peron, after Perón's return to Argentina in 1973, Puig fled to Mexico and remained there for two years. Three years later, he decided to abandon Argentina permanently after receiving telephone death threats from the Argentine Anti-Communist Alliance, the paramilitary death squad that was organized under Perón's last regime in the early 1970s. Puig spent two years in Mexico and in 1980 moved to Rio de Janeiro, the city that became his own uh, home until the end of the decade. Puig's last home was in Cuernavaca, where he died in 1990. Although. Although Puig's work is an indictment of repression in its broadest sense, whether social, political, or sexual, Puig's novels are most colored by the discourse and daily life of the early Perón regime from 1946 to 1955, which for Puig symbolizes repressive regimes in general, whether in the Argentina of the 1970s or in 1930s and 1940s Europe. In the early 1940s, Perón was open about his admiration for Nazis and fascists. Elements of these European regimes in Argentina included the control del Estado, a Gestapo's type, type secret force. The Argentine Socialist Party named Perón's 1948 constitutional changes the fascist reform. During this early period, Perón also achieved more apparently liberal political change. Even before his election, he won the support of many workers. Nevertheless, Perón screened union leaders, choosing only those who would adhere to his nationalist political agenda. Perón nationalized mass communications industries, railroads, ports, and electrical companies, produced a relatively stable bureaucracy, 
created labor legislation to protect children and enfranchised women, while Eva Perón established a feminine branch of the Peronist party. Eva died in 1952, the year Juan Perón was re-elected as president. In 1955, a military coup resulted in Perón's lengthy 17-year exile. Most of us uh, see Juan and Eva Perón through the lens of popular productions, such as the Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice musical that opened in 1978 or the 1996 film starring Madonna. Though unconcerned with historical accuracy, these representations do convey a sense of how Perón's disc discourse, particularly the speeches of Eva Perón, had the power to move people emotionally by means that are markedly similar to the techniques of melodramatic films. Literary melodrama's widespread appeal coincided historically with the wave of European immigration to Argentina in the late 19th century. Always sentimental in this period, melodrama focused on themes such as ideal but impossible love and represented characters that were in some sense socially excluded often for veiled reasons of religion, race, or social origins. The children of these European immigrants formed a new and social, uh, socially mobile um, working class in the early decades of the 20th century. At the same time, melodrama lost its focus on the socially marginalized. In its 1930s Hollywood incarnation, melodrama neglected the social outcast in favor of modern as well as unquestionably white and Christian middle-class characters, while it continued to ignore realities of cause and effect and sought, above all, to heighten spectators' emotions. Characterized by ideologies of eternal love between masculine men and properly feminine women, strict morality and compulsory and reproductive heterosexuality, Hollywood melodrama's promise of justice that rewards the good and punishes the bad has understandable appeal to upright and hardworking hard citizens who strive for happiness and prosperity. For an average second generation working class immigrant, 1930s melodramatic movies made anything possible, as long as you worked hard and lived clean, from ideal romantic love relationships to the rise from rags to riches. Eva Perón's discourse has equally understandable appeal, given her tendency to melodramatic exaggeration of emotions, her consistent emphasis on her modest social origins that established a bond of community between the woman and her people, and perhaps most of all, because of her constant cry for the vindication of the humble. Like Hollywood melodrama, Perona's discourse naturalized the ideology of two opposed and unequal genders and of reproductive heterosexuality. Both Juan and Eva Perón spoke of rational man's superiority to emotional woman, as well, of as, as well as of women's duty to the nation to have and raise children. Eva Perón explicitly claimed that women naturally feel inferior to men and opposed uh, women's innate common sense with men's natural capacity for higher thought. She also characterized men as acting in contrast to women as supporting and self-sacrificing. And while men were warlike, for Eva Perón, women were by nature loving. The symbol of the Argentine people, Eva Perón at once embodied the nation and represented an intermediary between the people and Perón, much as the Virgin Mary represents an intermediary between humanity and God. In her best melodramatic style, Eva Perón summed up women's subordination to men, and by extension, the people's subordination to Perón, when she said, everything I am, everything I have, everything I think, and everything I feel comes from Perón. The Peronist discourse of ideal and eternal romantic love is well-known and also well-worn in the tradition of Hollywood melodrama. In the case of Peronism, romantic love extended to love for the people by means of 
of the equation between family and nation that pervaded official speech. Eva Perón linked herself and the Argentine people as joined through their love of Juan Perón. She also explicitly pro proclaimed herself the mother of her land and carried herself and Juan Perón as parental figures to the people. Juan Perón, for his part, proclaimed that the nation was the home of all the brothers of the immense Argentine family and called the family the cell of the nation. The trope of the family as nation serves to cover up socioeconomic inequalities with an ideology of popular unity at the same time that it legitimizes state authority and naturalizes hi uh, hierarchical social relations. Just as women and children were naturally subordinate to the male head of the household, the Argentine people were naturally subordinate to Perón. Juan Perón implied the inevitability of socioeconomic hierarchy when he remarked that the only differences among people that should be recognized were those of nature. And in one of her speeches to members of the feminine branch of the Peronist party, Eva Perón summed up the ideolo uh, ideological equation between the hierarchical male-dominated family and the hierarchical male-dominated state when she affirmed that for women, being Peronist meant above all fidelity to Perón, subordination to Perón, and blind confidence in Perón. The ideological populism that the Perón regime assumed from its beginning can be understood as a reaction to the increasing political and social power of the new working class and its ideologies. By incorporating part of working class ideology, perhaps most notably through Eva Perón's theme of the vengeance of the humble, bourgeois ideology could maintain its dominance through a national identity grounded in the shared values that were both reflected and reinforced by Hollywood melodrama masculinity, femininity, feminine, family, and heterosexuality. Given its naturalization of two opposed genders, of reproductive sexuality, and of compulsory heterosexuality, Perona's discourse necessarily excluded from Argentina's national imaginary men who weren't masculine, women who weren't feminine, and anyone who wasn't straight. Manuel Puig cannot be characterized as writing anti-Peronist fiction. He claimed, perhaps disingenuously, that references to Peronism were not intended as political critique, but rather were a reflection of his personal experience of life in Argentina from the 1930s on. Nevertheless, numerous interviews attest to Puig's ambivalent view of Peronism, Though he recognized its socialist achievements, Puig was critical of what he perceived as Peronism's fascist tendencies, including the power held by Perón as an individual and the lack of a clearly articulated political theory. The compulsory heterosexuality that characterized the early Perón regime, as well as its equation of nation and family, are ideologically at odds with Puig's own beliefs. For Puig, the traditional family, with its male head of household, was the school in which exploitative relationships were learned. In Puig's words, and I quote, sexism is as serious as economic corruption and worker struggles. The battle of social freedom must begin there. The foundation of exploitation is in the relationship between men and women. Puig was unwilling to ground his identity in sexuality or gender claiming that, I quote again, for me, homosexuality doesn't exist. Heterosexuality doesn't exist either. I don't think there's a difference between men and women. The distinction between masculinity and femininity, the whole notion of role playing isn't natural. In some, Puig's personal views of family, gender, and sexuality are starkly opposed to the Peronist and melodramatic discourses that run throughout his work. For some, the phrase Argentine literature is a misnomer, given that Argentine writers have been deeply influenced by foreign literature. Jorge Luis Borges 
probably Argentina's most famous writer, was frequently criticized for his lack of interest in creating a properly Argentine literature, with perhaps more local color in the form of 19th century cowboys, and instead busying himself with avant-garde language games and European philosophical questions. Given Argentina's foreign tastes, it is not strange to find elements of foreign culture <coughs> excuse me, in Puig's books. What was seen as strange in the 1960s when Puig began to publish was that unlike the highbrow taste we find reflected in Borges, Puig consistently incorporated popular culture, especially popular film, into his work. Early criticism of Puig tended to focus on his use of mass culture and earn him a label as a pop writer. Indeed, Puig's incorporation of popular culture led Borges to dismiss Puig's writing with expressions of violent distaste. In the 1970s, members of the Latin American political left rejected Puig's writing, ostensibly because Puig's taste for lowbrow culture was seen as escapist and therefore apolitical and also probably because they classified Puig as a homosexual. More recent criticism tends to take Puig and his use of popular culture seriously, some identifying him as one of Latin America's first postmodern authors. From the 1980s onward, critics have overwhelmingly characterized Puig's work as a highly charged political critique that prefigures certain tendencies in women's writing highlighting the parallels between sexual and political exploitation and by insisting upon recognition of the personal as political. Some have argued that Puig's novels in themselves both, both imitate and undermine melodramatic films. Others have pointed out that in Puig's work, melodrama becomes camp in the sense of the word as a love of artifice and exaggeration that exposes supposedly natural identities as cultural roles that people perform. However, Puig's work can never be reduced to a purely critical stance toward popular film, given his well-known empathy for his characters. One critic has said that if anything can be called the Puig effect, it is this sustained sympathy for his characters, despite their silliness, their bad taste, their melodramatic passions, their weakness, and the way in which, like Don Quixote, they confuse poorly crafted fiction with real life. I would argue that Puig's empathy for his characters arises not despite, but because of their preference for a cinematic world in which good triumphs and love conquers all, in place of a real world characterized by patriarchal order, violence, and social injustice. Betrayed by Rita Hayworth is a collection of narratives of the inhabitants of Coronel Vallejos, the fictional Pampas town of the 1930s and 1940s that, according to Puig, represents his hometown of General Villegas, um, where weekly outings to the local cinema with his mother provided him with his only escape from uh, provincial life. And this in this doorway here is, in fact, uh, the house in which Puig was born. Mm. Although the narratives are organized non-hierarchically, and almost all of the characters interpret events through the lens of Hollywood films, the character of the young boy Toto is central throughout, as his own and others' narratives trace his growing up years from infancy to adolescence, chronicling his failure to conform to norms of masculinity, his distaste for heterosexuality, and his romantic interest in other boys, along with his imaginative and subversive recreations of the popular films that he sees with his mother. Given Puig's romantic relationships with men, <clears throat> his lifelong love of the movies, his video collection numbered over 4,000 titles, his childhood nicknamed Coco, and the parallels between Toto's authoritarian father and submissive mother and Puig's own male-dominated family. Some critics consider Betrayed by Rita Hayworth to be a thinly disguised autobiography. Indeed, Puig 
once said in an interview, Toto is me. The novel begins with a chapter titled At Nita's Parents Place, La Plata, 1933, in which family members discuss Toto's mother, Mita, and her move from La Plata to Vallejos, where she works in a hospital, and Berto, T Toto's father, struggles to maintain a small cattle ranch. With a minimum of words, Puig lets us know that Coronel Vallejos is noteworthy for what it doesn't have. And I quote, there's not a single tall building. They're always having droughts there, so you don't see many trees either. In the station, there are no taxis. You can find a few trees that are hardly growing, but what you don't see at all anywhere is real grass. We can get a sense of this from this picture of Puig's own hometown. We also discover that Toto's mother, Mita, is movie crazy, so much so that she married Berto because he looks like an actor. Most of the remaining 15 chapters are similarly titled with a place or character's name and a year. They pr proceed in chronological order from 1933 to 1948 until the last chapter, which returns the reader to the novel's beginning in 1933. We first meet Toto as an infant in the second chapter, which is comprised of the maid's dialogue at Toto's parents' house. Significantly, the house is labeled as only Berto's place, indicating that it belongs exclusively to Toto's father rather than to both of his parents. The 12-year-old's maid's comments to Toto reveal the socioeconomic inequities of provincial life in Argentina in the early 30s, she tells him that he is lucky to get a warm bottle of milk all the time, unlike her illegitimate niece, whose milk is always cold because the fire isn't lit at night. This scene reinforces a sense of the novel as semi-autobiographical. According to Puig, he first became aware of social injustice when he discovered as a child that his family's maid couldn't go to the movies with him and his mother. Toto's own first-person narrative begins in 1939, when he is six years old, picks up again when he is nine, and concludes with his high school sophomore essay titled, The Movie I Liked Best. The novel's chronology alludes to its wider political context and to the authoritarian regimes that Puig linked to the exploitation learned within the male-dominated family. It begins and ends in 1933, the year that Hitler was proclaimed cha or appointed chancellor of Germany and Mussolini was consolidating his dictatorial power. Toto was born in 1939, the year World War II began and Franco won the Spanish Civil War. Toto first speaks in 1942, when Perón was al already winning popular support. His sophomore essay is dated 1947, the year after Perón was first elected president. So is Esther's di diary, a chapter in which a young working class girl's narrative is an overt parody of Peronist populist discourse. Esther mentions that the people now have their own newspaper, repeating stock slogans from the Peronist daily Democracia, such as from home to work and from work to home. Hep Esther also says that children are the only privileged members of society, alluding to the Peronist labor legislation that pr protected children. Esther's style and tone mimic the melodrama of Peronist discourse and of the newspaper Democracia, as do her references to the vengeance of the humble against the oligarchy. In the same way that the Marxist theory tegle, uh, Terry Eagleton whom I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, characterizes literature as necessarily political, social, and historical. Betrayed by Rita Hayworth has much to say to us about power relations, um, politics, dominant ideologies, and history in the sense of what it means to be a particular type of person in Argentina in the 1930s and 1940s. More specifically, Betrayed by Rita Hayworth is a novel in which 1930s Hollywood melodrama tells us something about the 
repressive ideologies of gender and sexuality of the early Peron regime. It also shows us how someone might use a conservative film genre like Hollywood melodrama with its traditional norms of gender and sexuality to express and experience alternative gender and sexuality in ways that undermine the norms of both Hollywood movies and the equally conservative discourse of Juan and Eva Perón. With the exception of director, <coughs> excuse me, Ruben Mamoulian's 1941 film Blood and Sand, starring Rita Hayworth, all of the films incorporated into the novel Betrayed by Rita Hayworth are so-called women's films from the 1930s, and all of them are melodramas. As a young child, Toto's only glimpse of the world outside of his patriarchal home and hometown is constituted by his weekly visits to the cinema with his mother. Toto's first-person narrative begins in 1939, when he is six years old, and highlights his dissatisfaction with his family home, where, during nap time, his father Berto imposes a rule of silence and deprives him of his mother's company. In this novel, nap time is a euphemism for obligatory marital sex. Toto recalls interrupting his parents' so-called nap on one occasion and his father's threat to break him in two, a memory that provokes his decision to think about the movie he likes best because his mother told him to think about a movie if he got bored during nap time. Already the novel exposes the hierarchy and injustice that Puig saw as characteristic of traditional families. As the male head of the household, Berto determines when and whether his wife, Mita, will have sex with him. As Berto's subordinate, Mita must ensure that their child won't interfere with Berto's pleasure. And as the person at the bottom of the familial hierarchy, when Toto breaks the rules, he is threatened with paternal violence. For most of the novel, Toto shows his faith in the ideologies of Hollywood melodrama. The first film that Toto recreates is director George Cukor's 1936 Romeo and Juliet. Toto's choice of films reveals his belief in an ideal and eternal love that sharply contrasts with the reality of his parents' relationship, as well as his enjoyment of melodrama's capacity to heighten its spectators' emotions. As the six-year-old Toto says to himself, Romeo and Juliet is about love. It has a sad ending when they die, one of the movies I liked best. Toto goes on to talk to himself about the actress Norma Shearer, who plays Juliet in this version. Toto says, she's an actress who's never naughty. I have pictures of her serious, laughing, and in profile cut out of every magazine, in lots of movies I have never seen. Toto's identification of Norma Shearer as an actress who is always good, and not as her character, reflects his faith in the truths produce, produced by the star system of the 1930s, in which actresses' public personae mirrored their cin cinematic roles. Like other actresses of the time, Shearer always played the same type, she epitomized the 1930s ideal of womanhood, sophisticated, noble, and maternal. She was the opposite of the femme fatale or the social climber that would appear on screen in the 1940s. Her gestures, makeup, and clothing, whether on film, in photos, or in public, affirmed the 1930s ideological link between beauty and goodness. And you can see in this photo the way she's posed with her hands. There's a suggestion of an almost childlike innocence and modesty. Um, she also seems to have a ring on, on her uh, wedding ring finger on her left, left hand, as, as she should. Um, okay. uh, like her fellow actresses, Louise Rayner and Ginger Rogers, among others, Shearer's persona conformed to Hollywood's patriarchal ideology 
that limited women's roles to those of girlfriend, wife, and mother, whose self-sacrifice and support of their men was necessary to preserve social order. As such, Schur also embodied the Peronist ideal of femininity. The well-known actress and sing uh, dancer, Ginger Rogers, was a kind of middle-class version of Norma Shearer, who held great appeal for the average woman in the 1930s. Rogers' persona also conformed to dominant ideals of femininity. She was beautiful, good, and stood behind her man, while inhabiting the luxurious fairy tale world of the Rogers and Astaire Depression era musicals in which many women took refuge. And um, Ginger, um, unlike Norma Shearer, had a more natural girl type of beauty that strongly appealed to women because they could then identify um, themselves with her and feel the possibility of experiencing these fantastic worlds of the musicals. Toto's favorite Ginger Rogers film is unusual for her in that, like the other movies he likes best, it is a melodrama. For Toto, director H.C. Potter's 1939, The Story of Vernon and Irene Castle, and I quote, is the best Ginger Rogers film because it's a musical and has a sad ending, that Fred Astaire dies in the war in a crashed airplane and she's waiting for him but he doesn't come. Like Romeo and Juliet, this is another representation of the ideal and eternal love that both Toto and his mother believe in. Though Astaire's character dies, as Mita explains to Toto, Roger's character is not sad, and I quote, because it's like they were together. Now nothing can keep them apart, war or no war. And like all the melodramas Toto enjoys, Emotions are heightened and realities are ignored as the tears roll down Ginger's face and she looks toward the empty stage where she and Astaire were to have danced in a charity show. She suddenly sees the two of them, now transparent figures, who dance off into the distance so that even after death, the good receive their reward. Despite his belief in the premises of melodrama, including his overt acceptance of polarized gender roles and the naturalness of heterosexual relationships, in his own life, Toto deviates from the norms of gender and sexuality found in Peronist discourse as much as in the movies. Most obviously, Toto's taste for women's films does not conform to the masculinity expected of him, especially by his father, Berto. Toto is accustomed to using the women's bathroom at the cinema with his mother because, as Mita explains to him, women can't go into the men's. In other words, males have access to women's space, but women do not have access to men's. The six-year-old Toto is horrified at his father's insistence that he use the men's washroom at a school concert. His father finally sends him off to the women's washroom with an older girl who, like Berto, labels Toto a sissy. Berto grows increasingly angry with Toto's liking for women's films. He punishes Toto by not allowing him to go to the movies for a time. Berto also says that he will send Toto to a convent far away from his mother, thereby threatening to destroy Toto's only close relationship and to emasculate him by locking him up in a feminine space. For Berto, Toto would either become a normal male or be a permanent outcast. Toto's failure to achieve nor uh, masculinity shows up in other ways, including his taste for drawing film scenes and playing with dresses, which Berto prohibits, as well as through his distaste for such masculine pursuits as soccer, swimming, and bike riding. Hector, Toto's cousin, is Toto's opposite, given his properly masculine and nationalist fantasies of becoming a soccer hero, and given his taste in actresses. He likes Anne Sheridan because she has a great pair of breasts. 
Berto goes to the movies only once with Toto and Nita, and significantly, it is to see Blood and Sand, the 1941 color film in which Rita Hayworth plays the femme fatale who seduces Tyrone Par uh, Powers' character, leading him into infidelity, ruin, and death. Unlike the melodramas Toto prefers, in this film the good are not rewarded and feminine beauty does not equate to morality. Berto sincerely enjoys the film, primarily because for him, Rita Hayworth is sexually desirable. And I think you can see the enormous difference between, besides the color, um, between this film and the images of Norma Shearer and Ginger Rogers. Um, first of all, um, Rita Hayworth, um, the directors considered her to, as exuding sex. She was always cast in sexy parts. And in this picture, she is positioned above Tyrone Powers, suggesting her dominance over him. Other characters' perceptions consistently suggest that Toto is gay. As children, Hector labels Toto a fag because he cries. And in high school, one girl accuses him of being in love with the handsome senior, Ademar. Even Herminia, Toto's spinster piano teacher, writes in her diary that Toto reminds her, and I quote, more and more of a homosexual. He's very effeminate in his ways. Such perceptions are backed up by Toto's own film-based fantasies. Unlike Berto and Hector, who desire female film stars, Toto identifies with the heroines he admires. In one instance, he imag imagines a kind of montage of Dorothy L'Amour films set in the South Pacific, in which, like the feminine heroine, Toto is rescued by Raul Garcia, the highly masculine, handsome, and athletic schoolmate that Toto admires. In Toto's sophomore year composition, which he titled The Movie I Liked Best, Toto recreates director uh, Julien Duvivier's 1938 film The Great Waltz. In Toto's version of the film, there are two protagonists, the male hero, Johann Strauss, and the female heroine, Carla. Johann is Toto's alter ego. Though artistic and talented, he is small and physically weak. Through what Toto describes as a miracle of love, the heroine sees Johan not as he is, but rather as the handsome and masculine high school senior whom Toto desires. In this way, Toto is at once Johan, the less than ideally masculine figure transformed, and also the heroine in love with the high school senior. In all his recreations of movies, Toto undoes the ideological opposition between women and men by drawing attention to the artifice of the films he has seen and by presenting femininity as constructed and performed. Toto's consistent use of actresses instead of characters' names emphasizes the distinction between the reality of the actresses and the fictional nature of the heroines. Toto highlights Hollywood's production of femininity through repeated comments on clothing, hairstyles, and camera work. In his composition, for example, Toto describes the white of the heroine's myriad gauzes and her fair skin and coral lips, foregrounding the costu costuming and makeup that are needed to produce her feminine beauty. He also remarks that the hero should tell his mother to put up her hair to show off her high and noble forehead. And he writes that when Johan sees the heroine at the end of the film, her skin is not white and her lips aren't coral. Rather, and I quote, her face is transparent over the sky of Vienna, a heavenly vision that comes closer and closer, like reality once came close to being dream. Here, Toto's description not only suggests the camera's role in constructing beauty and evoking emotion, but also his adolescent recognition that dream and reality are two very different things. 
The theme of betrayal runs through throughout Puig's novel. Beginning in the first chapter, when we find out that Toto's mother, Mita, married his father, Berto, because he looks like a popular actor. As such, Mita betrays Berto by marrying him because he looks like, she actor, like, like an actor she admires, and not because she loves the person he is. While Berto betrays Mita because he's not what he at first appears to be. Toto is betrayed by almost every other character the schoolmates who taunt him, the relatives who lament his femininity, his father who dreams of having a new and normal son, and his mother who eventually favors Toto's appropriately masculine cousin over her own child. The English translation of Puig's title, betrayed by Rita Hayworth, conveys little more than the meaning of the 1941 film Blood and Sand in which Rita Hayworth's character betrays the hero played by Tyrone Power. The original title, La Traición de Rita Hayworth, positions Rita Hayworth not only as the betrayer, but also as the betrayed. As such, the Spanish version hints at Hollywood's exploitation of actresses and also of their female fans who can never live up to the idealized femininity of the movies and who will never experience the eternal love that is represented as the reward of the good woman. Perhaps the most important betrayal that emerges in Puig's work is the gulf between fantasy and reality, between Hollywood melodrama's promise to reward the good and punish the bad, and the real world's social, economic, and political violence. Like the 1941 film Blood and Sand, in which the good suffer and the bad emerge victorious, the reality of small town Argentina in the 1930s and 40s um, betrays its inhabitants through violence and injustice. By virtue of Toto's failure to conform to norms of masculinity and his aversion to heterosexuality, he is excluded from the nationalist imaginary of the early Peron regime that informs the novel, and also punished through social marginalization and threats of violence. Yet Toto's recreations of Hollywood melodramas transform the conservative characteristics of this genre. Instead of reinforcing rigid gender roles and compulsory heterosexuality, Toto's imagined versions of Hollywood movies are opportunities to experience uh, to experience socially unacceptable forms of gender and sexuality. In this sense, Puig's novel, Betrayed by Rita Hayworth, restores melodrama's 19th century focus on the socially marginalized as it simultaneously subverts the ideologies of early Peronism and of Hollywood movies. As I said at the beginning of this talk, I think that the Marxist theorist Terry Eagleton's greatest contribution to literary criticism is to show that the study of literature is necessarily the study of power relations in the wider society. Reading Puig's novel, Betrayed by Rita Hayworth, is to study the relationship between the ostensibly personal effects of male dominance and politically repressive regimes. Thank you.